So, the next story is probably, it's definitely not the most expensive car we've ever sold. It's probably not the most significant, but it's one of the coolest histories of any classic car that I've ever encountered, just because the level of preservation and, and, and what this car represented. When Curated first started, we were known originally for having cars under a thousand miles. We had a, a Diablo with a thousand miles, we had an XG220 with 500 miles. We had all these really low mileage cars and we still have a ton of sub thousand mile cars, sub 5,000 mile cars. We've slowly bought you know cars with 10,000 miles that were historically significant, but, but we always sort of have looked for these crazy low mileage cars cars that they're they're known as benchmark cars so a benchmark as this is a benchmark for originality and preservation and future generations if you're restoring a car can use that car as as an example um, so imagine there's not like books or, or photos from from many of the cars during the period to say this is the correct bolt or this is the correct rubber today we're using these cars or talking to other experts and slowly unfortunately some of these experts are slowly dying off so we don't sell a lot of Jaguar E-Types, but it's one of the cars that I would say I know a lot about because my family's history. My dad's owned probably 50 Jaguar E-Types. It's one of his favorite cars in the world. He has, I believe, his first Jaguar E-Type uh, from 1967. Uh, his father was the original owner and he still has that car today uh, with like 18,000 miles. So I know a lot about them and I've always talked about them and I've told friends that we love them. But as, a, as, as sort of our retail model, it doesn't really fit our DNA of the 80s, 90s supercars. I got a call one day from a very, very good friend of mine. And she is someone I grew up with in the Palm Beach Gardens area. And she called me and she doesn't really know too much about cars, but she, she likes cars. And she said that her, her boyfriend, who I guess she had just gotten engaged at the time, she's now later married to the same gentleman, um, her boyfriend's father had a brand new Jaguar XKE. And I, I, my immediate, I said, no, you mean like, what do you mean an, a brand new XKE? She goes, no, 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 a brand, he has a brand new XKE. And I said, you mean like an XKE? Like, like, do you mean like a, a new Jaguar XK coupe? And she says, no, it's a brand, like a vintage one, like what you like. I'm like, I don't, there's no such thing. Did he restore it? Did he restore it back to the, you know, he changed the odometer to zero after he restored it? She said, no, it's brand new. So I was really confused. I said, can you just send me his number of the details? And I sort of, I have to be honest, I brushed it off. Um, sorry, Ashley, I definitely brushed you off. At first I was like, yeah, okay, all right. So I ended up, she gave me his number and I called this, this, this guy and the area code was Northern Florida and So I waited a few days, I called back again, and now at this point, I still had no idea what this car was. It could be a 2012 Jaguar XK Coupe brand new. So I call again. He says, yeah, well, I really don't wanna sell it, but we wanna buy our dream home, it's a beach house, I'm ready to sell it. So we go back and forth, and I'm trying to get as much details as I can out of him. He goes, well, I bought a 1971 Jaguar XKE. I never titled it. I never registered it. And it has about a thousand miles. And I was sort of shocked. I'm like, it, what? Like, it, does this even exist? I, I'd never heard of a Jaguar XKE from the 70s, never titled, never registered with no miles. I mean, you see it, you know, you'll see a Porsche 1989 Turbo Cabriolet occasionally come up. You'll see a newer Viper occasionally come up, but to see a car from the 60s or 70s like this is unheard of. I've maybe seen one of other, one or two other cars like this in my career. Um, so I was pretty, pretty shocked, honestly. Fast forward, my immediate reaction was to him. I said, listen, I want the car. I'll drive up today, tomorrow. You tell me when I can come up to see the car. I wanna see the car. So he was located just outside of Daytona Beach. So it was probably a four or five hour drive. So literally the next morning I jumped in my car, I drove straight to Daytona Beach, and I, I basically pull up to this gentleman's house, and he opens the garage door, and there it is. It's a silver 
on red, which let's face it, is an incredible color for any classic car. Silver on red, Jaguar XK Roadster, completely preserved on its original tires, original interior, original paint. Literally nothing was touched on this car. Now my dad's a complete perfectionist and my dad picks apart everyone's cars. Oh, that guy didn't restore it right. Oh, that's wrong, this is wrong. And as I'm sending my father these photos, I'm texting him photos, he's shocked. He's like, wow, like this is a really nice example. And with the car came its original MSO, which is basically the document from the manufacturer that the dealer then turns into a title for the new owner. So the original MSO that it was never titled, all of the books, all of the paperwork, the floor mats, I mean, the car was perfectly complete. Now, the only problem with the car was that it wasn't automatic. So yes, a manual version would be much more desirable, but regardless, forget the fact that it was an automatic, it's a brand new and never registered, no mileage Jaguar E-Type. So we ended up starting negotiating and you know, honestly, his asking price was not that bad considering what it was. Sometimes you get a lot of people in their head and they think they have this car and they think it's a million dollar car when in the reality it's, X. Um, so he was pretty realistic. So we started negotiating back and forth. And I was so excited at the time that uh, of the quality that I didn't even mind paying up because I knew someone else in the world would appreciate it. So I paid a, a, a fair number for the car. And then we discussed closing. We were going to close a week later. So we ended up getting everything sorted out and blah, 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 blah. And I sent a dear friend of mine, um, a professional auto transport, Marley. He's the best flatbed guy I know, to personally go pick up this car, make sure nothing happens to it, make sure it's not raining. And it's a four hour drive, so I, I was more concerned um, about the car not being touched in any way, and I wanted it directly from there to here on his flatbed. So I'll never forget, Marley called me and he goes, what's going on? He goes, I'm here, and this guy's crying. And it, it honestly, it hurt me, it was like, Man, I'm taking this guy's, you know, a piece of this guy's, you know, history. So, so in the end, the story was that this gentleman actually purchased and he purchased the car brand new and that he had bought the car. He'd left the dealership. You didn't have to register cars back then so quickly. And in that period, the dealership he bought the car from went out of business. So he had no license plate. He had nothing to actually drive the car. So he has to get in touch with an attorney back then, get in touch with Jaguar cars and try to get the MSO or try to get something to title this car. In the meantime, he's a young guy. He wants to enjoy his life. He goes and buys another Jaguar E-Type to drive. So he has two E-Types. One he's driving because it's legally registered and titled and the other is sitting waiting. Years go on. The legal process has happened. He finally gets his MSO. Everything gets sorted out through Jaguar. The attorneys fix it. At that point, he had sold his other E-Type. He had loved this car so much, but things change. He had kids, he had a family, and what was he really gonna do with this Jaguar E-Type? He decided to just put it away. So that's how the car ended up so well-preserved, so original. We brought it to Miami, we detailed it. My dad was super impressed. Um, we didn't really advertise the car too much. It was something that I loved owning and, and it was just such a piece of history. One day, a collector in, in sort of the community hears about this car and he calls me and he says, John, I will pay you exactly what you're asking for as long as the car is as, as original as you say. I said, listen, you can send anyone in the world. I'm telling you, if my dad says the car's this nice, it is. So he sends an expert um, out of the Midwest, a very famous Jaguar expert. And in addition to sending the expert, they're on the phone with another expert and they spend seven, eight hours with this car. They're checking everything. They're taking the spare out. They're looking at everything. So at the end of the day, finally the expert comes to me and I said, so what do you think? And he goes, well, I found one flaw. And I was actually shocked. I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? He goes, well, no, someone at some point changed the wiper blades and they put the wrong wiper blades. Now we're talking a, a $30 fix, a $100 fix, whatever it would be. But it was funny just to hear him say that, like I found one flaw. So obviously this collector bought it. Um, he owns it to this day. It went to an incredible home. 
I believe he has another 100, 200 cars with like sub thousand miles. One of the best collections in the country. And um, it was an incredible story. And to this day, it always makes me laugh getting the phone call. Um, and it was an honor to be part of this car's history. But looking back, it's probably a car that, you know, sometimes you wish there's cars you didn't sell. Uh, you, you regret because how do you replace that? And it's definitely one of them. I think I could have sold it five, six more times. Um, and it's something that I would have loved to put away for a future generation to enjoy. Thank you.